challenges and issues, divergent views that we all know about. So some of the global trends. We know, um, David alluded to a moment ago, that we will have to feed 2.5 billion more people by 2050. And we're not starting from scratch. There are already 1 billion who are hungry. So we're talking about feeding 3.5 billion more people by 2050. On a land frontier that is largely reached, and some say is at its ecological limits. Just to give you an idea, in terms of how much more cereal grains we will need by 2050, one billion more, of which more than half of that one billion will be for, for feeding livestock, part of the food feed equation, the competition. But what has startled the globe recently is the fact that food prices started to fluctuate very widely in 2008, occasioned largely by diminished stockpiles. The huge stockpiles of grain and butter and milk and all have disappeared in the last few decades. And the world finds itself where small changes in any one of the major producing countries can drive the market into a tizzy and, of course, issues such as new policies on biofuels, uh, rising, rising fuel prices and so on, have all impacted on the price of food, and so we have these wild fluctuations. We know that population is growing. We'll expect to stabilize about 10 billion, but also, importantly, population is urbanizing, and very rapidly. We know that poverty is declining and percentage-wise, but in numbers terms, more slowly because population is growing. But this is 1.5. This is absolute poverty. We're attaining $1.5 a day does not make anybody rich. It is just the threshold of absolute poverty. So if we're thinking about making people reasonably comfortable, we should be talking about gaining much more than 1.5 per day for the people who we're attempting to address. This gives some indication of where the poor are and those living in abject poverty, as I, I said. We know that some of the broad trends uh, show that consumption will continue to rise in relation to population, income, and urbanization that I just referred to. Significant global differences, however, in global caloric intake. So the debate about who eat too much and, um, is not uh, uniform. Highest rates of increases in consumption of livestock products taking place in the developing world. And livestock contributes about 17% of the calories and about 33% of the global protein. And livestock provide food for uh, at least 800 million people. This gives you a bit of a summary about what global consumption would look like between the developed and the developing now, or 2020 and 2050. And you can see that in the developing world, what would happen to meat, almost three times, and milk. So the challenges are quite uh, enormous if we're going to meet these demands and meet them in environmentally sustainable ways. Um, in terms of dollars kilogram, dollars per kilometer square per year, value of livestock products, you can see that while demand is growing in the developing world, the value of livestock is not there yet. It's mostly in the temperate regions of the world, although there is some regional differences. Where does the, the food we, we eat come from? Well. At the present time, a very large proportion of it is coming from the developed world. But important for our business is that 
whether it's cereal, milk, beef, or lamb, much of it is produced in mixed systems. So crop livestock systems do matter. Um, local markets matter, but trade is increasing, as you can see, nine, between 1980 and 2006. Not large amounts of livestock products are traded as a percentage, but it's increasing, as you can see from, from these numbers. Local markets matter, and matter most, perhaps, but trade is increasing. And the point here is that as we talk about competitiveness of smallholders, we have to consider competitiveness in an open market where higher producing countries will compete in poor markets like in, in, in Africa and, and parts of Asia. So trade does influence when we talk about the competitiveness of local producers. Some of the issues, of course, we know the issue of livestock and climate change. Um, and this map attempts to show feed resources, disease productivity. As climate is changing, all these issues will come under pressure. If we talk about where meat is produced in relation to greenhouse gas efficiency, you can see that the developing tropics, particularly in Africa, is the least efficient areas. So much of the efficiency in production in terms of greenhouse gas emissions to be found in the developed parts of the world where productivity is high. And Henning will, will, I'm sure, talk more about this. In addition to climate change, we know the issue of water. Water is very scarce and becoming increasingly so. Some say the next war will be about water. Uh, you can see from this figure, over 2 billion people lack access to water. Uh, agriculture could consumes about 80% of fresh water withdrawals. And also, there, although there is great disparity in the numbers with respect to how water is used in livestock systems, often the number that is used about water consumption is what is used in greenhouse, and that is not typical the world over. But nonetheless, water is an important resource that we need to think about. Land use, a very important issue as well. 3.4 billion hectares, about 26% is rangelands. What are we going to do about those? Are they going to be part of the equation, both in uh, climate amelioration, the food equation, and the livelihoods equation? How are how is those people going to be affected? 470 million hectares, 33% of arable lands. You can see what the cereal and uh, soybean and other production use of that land is, is like. I alluded to the fact of rangelands. I want to go quickly because I know Henning is going to come back to tackle some of these issues. But what are we going to do about the rangelands, which is a third of the terrestrial surface? where most of the pastoralists who live on the margins exist, and um, can we bring those into payment for environmental services, for example, where we have those rangelands com contribute both to food security but also to addressing the livestock footprint. Um, I put this, we put this slide in to reflect that there is huge transactions taking place of land around the world. Some 60 million hectares are under discussion and or lease and or purchase between many parts. You can see the open circle and the closed ones is from whom well, seeking land where. And this is quite a global <coughs> phenomenon. Although, by comparison, as a percentage of total land, not an enormous quantity, but nonetheless, a lot of government policies in developing countries are starting to be influenced by this trend. Is this foreign direct investment, as we would like, some would like to call it, 
or is it land grab to dispossess the people in the developing world of, of valuable resource? Question. I am sure Bernard will talk about the issue of livestock and diseases. This is quite important, particularly in the context of zoonotic diseases. But um, we also will discuss the endemic diseases versus the pandemic and how should we address them. We will talk to her about consumption, those who eat too much and those who eat too little, and I'll come back to this at, at, at the end. But note that the figures, there are about two billion people who are overweight, and much of this people are saying is because they eat too much livestock products. Now, this is not always true, but that's the message that we get, that this is really bad for the planet. Often this is what is talked about, and people ignore that there are places where not enough is eaten. And increasingly we'll hear about animal welfare issues as consumer pressure, more in the more advanced countries, more sophisticated taste and preferences and so on. Uh, consumer pressure is putting pressure on the suppliers who will in fact put pressure on the producers. So this is not an issue we can ignore, the issue of animal welfare and so on. So what are some of the issues, and I try to go through those slides very quickly so we could come to these ones, because these are some of the key things that I hope we can talk about, and you would add many more, I hope. Paul Collier, bottom billion, Small producers have no role. Is that true? It's a waste of time if we're talking about meeting food security. Small producers can't do it. It, will must, it must be big producers. Um, how are we going to address this? We believe that small producers will contribute. The question is how we will we make them contribute in a sustainable way? And how would we address this in our, in our messaging? Smallholder development possible, more pro-poor. If we were able to do this, get smallholders to market, we will help reduce their poverty. But others say if we're really going to deal with the food security question, we need larger producers. Is this true? Of course, the advantage is small producers have low opportunity costs, but they have little marketing bargaining power. The issue of diversity, uh, small producers promote diversity and uh, better management of the ecosystem services. This is what we say. Is it true? Do we have any evidence? Can we, can we make this case? And how do we do that? And how do we organize the smallholder sector so that they have leverage, um, marketing, buying power, and, and uh, able to de determine the terms of trade, which they are nearly always the takers of the terms of trade? and what would be the trajectory of change. And by region, there are different opportunities in Africa than Asia, I suppose. The phenomenon of the supermarket increasingly becoming the case even in poor developing countries. <clears throat> the big supermarket chains are buying up small ones in developing countries and therefore some of the tastes and preferences, including the issues about welfare and so on, are being filtered through, through these supermarket chains into developing countries where they did not appear before. Trade-offs on the environment, um, for example, we can use the biomass that we take off from these mixed systems that I told you are most important in livestock production. Are, they are we sacrificing soil amendments in relation to feed? And how do we deal with that? Can we reduce the number of animals? We said to cut the livestock footprint, we need to make them more efficient. So we need fewer of them, but higher producing. What is the implication of that for livelihoods? And how overall we re address the environmental footprint of livestock in, in all systems? The issue of who eat too little and who eat too much is not going to go away. We have to address this, and how would, how would we do that? So some of the main messages from this, 
Is it possible to feed the world? We think so, we must. What would be the role of livestock in this? Sustaining natural resources, we can. Can we make smallholder livestock systems both more productive, productive and also uh, make better use, more efficient use of natural resources and reduce the necessarily negative as aspects of livestock systems? Can we reduce up absolute poverty by engaging livestock and not only absolute poverty, but addressing making people through livestock more well off? Um, as I said earlier, demands for livestock products will continue to rise. Um, developing systems are producing much of the livestock increasingly in the world and vast divide between regions and within within countries you can have very productive livestock producers very inefficient ones as well so the spatial heterogeneity of the questions that we're trying to deal with the livestock impact and global development in, uh, uh, issues and evidence a lot of what is said about livestock now is because our methodologies are weak we don't have the numbers uh, and we can't make the case and so those who come up with whatever evidence they come up with and use, we have a hard time adjudicating because we don't have the numbers. And of course, uh, how can we be, uh, organize the sector better, Management, uh, mani managing trade-offs at multiple scales, and uh, the key question of achieving equity, which I hope Carlos will, will help us point to.